Welcome back to House Judiciary Committee after a uh, brief recess. And we're going to resume our testimony on S3. And I would like to start with Wilda White, founder of Mad Freedom. Good morning, Wilda. Welcome. Good morning, Chair Brad, and good morning, um, House Committee on the Judiciary. My name is Wilda White, and I'm the founder of an organization called Mad Freedom. Uh, which is a human and civil rights advocacy organization whose mission is to secure political power to end the discrimination and oppression of people based on their perceived mental states. Um, as I told the committee before, we are not a mental health advocacy organization. We are a rights-based uh, organization. Um, and so my uh, testimony today is uh, focused on, on rights um, and, and not really mental health. Um, and I, you know, this is not a bill that I've actually wanted to weigh in on. I followed it in the Senate Judiciary Committee um, and, and, and did not test, was not invited to testify and did not testify there. Um, but, uh, and, and the reason for my trepidation uh, is because I find that um, the, the, the more you know about the issue kind of intimately, uh, it, 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 the more complex it is, there are no easy answers. Um, what, what I found remarkable about the testimony in the Senate was everybody seemed very sure uh, of their position and, and the righteousness of it. And I don't come to you today um, with any of that um, <laughs> certainty or, or that I'm right. Um, what, what I hope to do by my testimony uh, it, or raise issues um, policy questions, uh, maybe issues of constitutional law that I think that uh, prudent decision makers should take into account when passing on a bill um, of, of, this, of this magnitude. So when I say a kind of what I know, um, it's based not only on the fact that, I, you know, I, I am an attorney, I have practiced law, uh, I was a trial lawyer, um, I am also the, the legal guardian of a brother who has a diagnosis of schizophrenia um, and who has also been uh, caught up in the criminal justice system. Um, and I am also a person who has experienced uh, mania and psychosis for a protracted period of time. Um, and, uh, and so that personal experience um, is very different from being a guardian, uh, being a lawyer, um, being a, 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 a lay person in our society. Uh, and I've also been the victim um, of a, a sexual assault. So I also bring that um, perspective here. So I'm not insensitive to anyone's um, position, um, but I think it just makes it uh, a more complex decision. So. I think what I'd like to do before I begin is just do some kind of table setting um, because I was actually confused by some of the testimony explaining what this bill was doing. And so I prepared a flow chart to help me. Um, and, I, and I'd like to use that flow chart um, to illustrate my, my testimony, um, if I may. It would require me to share a screen. Absolutely, thank, thank you very much. So am I, have I been given that, have I been, yes, I have been given that. Um, okay. Share. This is when it gets dicey. I think, I think I'll share my screen and then I will pull up the PowerPoint. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, yeah. cool. Excellent. So far, so good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is who I am. And uh, basically what I'm gonna be sharing is a, um, a flow chart uh, about the competency to stand trial and the insanity defense. Um, so basically, uh, as I understand what we're talking about today, a person is arrested um, and we start at this corner here. I'm gonna try to use my mouse pointer 
we start at this corner where the person is arrested. And then the first next step in the process is to ask the question, question has the person been charged on information, complaint, or indictment? And if the answer is no, um, the answer can be no, and it could be because um, they were not indicted by reason of insanity. And in that case, they are sent to a commitment hearing. Um, and when they go to the commitment hearing, the determination is um, whether this person is in need of treatment. Let's see, that was the fancy part. Um, or whether the patient is in need of further treatment. And you can see from the slide and the uh, handout that I sent in advance, what the question is in that, in that instance. Then um, if the answer is yes, they have been charged on information complaint or indictment, th they proceed to court or, or trial. And then the, God, this is very jumpy this morning, I'm sorry. Um, and then the question there, um, the first question there is, is the defendant competent? I don't know why this keeps switching, but I apologize. Um, so the question is, is the person competent? Um, and then this is a determination um, that says, is the person competent to stand trial? Um, and the questions there are different than the ones in the commitment. There we wanna know, does the defendant know the charges against them and how severe they are? Does the, can the defendant tell you how a trial works and do they know what guilty and not guilty is? Do they know what the role of their attorney is and the prosecutor? And do they understand like plea bargaining and their rights to appeal? And that question is asked at the time of trial. Um, so if the answer, so, so anybody can challenge someone's competency. It can be the court, it could be the prosecutor, it could be the defendant's own attorney, the defendant's guardian. What's important to understand here is that the defendant has no um, ability or right to waive a competency um, examination um, or someone's questioning their competency. Um, they just have to submit um, to an examination. Um, and this is a constitutional right. The Supreme Court has says you are not, it's unconstitutional to try a person uh, for a crime who is not competent. So the defendant has absolutely kind of no choice here. They have to submit to a competency examination. Um, and then, as you know, um, the court on its own or at the request of any of the parties um, can order an examination and then, it, um, and then a, neutral a neutral examiner is selected um, by the Department of Mental Health. And then the question there is, you know, you know competent, not competent. So if the person is found um, not competent, they are also sent to a commitment hearing. And again, the question is whether the person essentially, the question is whether the person is a danger to themselves or others. If the person is competent, um, they just go back into the regular process of the trial. Um, and then the question there is, are they gonna raise insanity as a defense? And this is something that the defendant actually has a choice, right? Um, they don't have to raise insanity as a defense, even if, even if they were insane at the time of the trial, they don't have to raise it as, as a defense. But if they do, um, the court, um, there's an examination and both the defendant's attorney um, and the prosecution are allowed to, by law, um, conduct an examination of the uh, defendant. And then the question then is, at the time of the at the time of the crime, was the defendant able to appreciate the criminality of his or her conduct, or um, were they able to conform their conducts to the requirements of the law? Um, and if they couldn't appreciate the criminality of their conduct or conform their conduct to the requirements of the law, 
um, if they prove that by, by more likely than not um, to, a, to a jury usually. Um, anyway, that's, that basically that's what an examiner is trying to decide. Could they conform their conduct or did they know that what they were doing was wrong? Um, so that examination is done. They go to trial uh, and the jury kind of has three uh, options. They can find the person not guilty by reason of insanity. They can find the person guilty, meaning they didn't believe the person was insane at the time, or they can find the person not guilty. So if the person is not guilty by reason of insanity, they're sent to a commitment hearing. Um, and I've told you what the determination is there. And so I've put these, um, you'll see that uh, these, there are three boxes here that are in purple. And I put those in purple here because those are the areas where the S3 proposes to change the law. And those are also kind of decision points um, in this process. So um, the, the first thing that, you know, S3 um, changes in this process uh, I'll start with um, basically the uh, competency examination. Um, the first thing that's changed is that um, the law says the report of this examination can now be sent to the Department of Mental Health. Um, they were not listed in the original uh, in the existing law. And the only comment I have this is that um, it also says uh, that reports um, can be um, sent to the state's attorney and the respondent's attorney if the respondent, and this, in this case, it's the defendant is represented by uh, an attorney. But there's no provision in S3 that would provide the defendant with a copy of the report. And that would be uh, my suggestion is that the law be, uh, this law be, uh, this bill be amended to allow the defendant to receive a copy of the report. Um, again, like I say, I'm coming from a rights perspective and I also come from an experience perspective because I was actually sent to, um, uh, I, I was actually in California was um, committed and had a commitment hearing. And, um, you know, I, I, I had the, the lawyer who was assigned to represent me met me on the morning of the hearing I interviewed him, you know, asked him questions about, you know, what's the process? What's the burden of proof? What's the standard of proof? And he couldn't answer any of these questions to my satisfaction, so I elected to represent myself. Um, and so this is not, you know, not everybody will be allowed to represent themselves, particularly in Vermont. I think um, Vermont doesn't allow you to represent yourself if you're at a commitment hearing. Um, but nevertheless, I feel like a defendant has a right um, to that report and, um, and I, I feel that the law should be amended to uh, give that person uh, an une unequivocal right to a copy of the report. Um, um, excuse me, Walter, I just want to th um, thank, thank you for your suggestion. I just want to make sure I, um, I understand where that, are you looking at section one? I'm, um, I'm on page one yeah. um, in C1. Yep. Uh, okay. It says the report shall be, it's the last uh, sentence mm -hmm. on that page. The report shall be transmitted to the court issuing the order for examination and copies of the report sent to the state's attorney, to the respondent's attorney if the respondent is represented by counsel and to the commissioner of mental health. Um, and I think that the respondent should be entitled to an exam, to a copy. Um, okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. And, and not to brag, but I successfully represented myself at the commitment hearing. Um, and in fact, as I was, uh, you know, free to go, I had several of my uh, <laughs> other patients in the hospital trying to get me to represent them. So it's not impossible to represent yourself. It's probably not advisable, but it's not, a po it's not impossible. Maxine, can I ask a question? I'm sorry. Absolutely. No, thank you for, thank you for jumping in. And yeah, um, committee members, if I don't see your hand, it's, it's, it's because sometimes it's tricky with uh, screen sharing. Go ahead, Barbara. Thank you. So, Wilda, this chart is amazing. Thank you, because it's been hard to, um, it's just very helpful. 
Um, if you, given the fact that you successfully represented yourself and could interview your attorney, doesn't that even, doesn't that by itself show competence? To... You know, <laughs> you know yeah, I mean, this is, this is a, 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 I like this question because it gives me an opportunity to talk about these, this competency uh, um, examination because, you know, it's all up to a psychiatrist or a psychologist and you can get, you can pay a psychiatrist or a psychologist to say anything. And I, I don't say that cynically. I say that as a person who was a trial attorney who hired experts. Every case I brought, I had to hire an expert witness. And every case I brought had an expert witness on the other side. And they were not saying the same thing. Um, there, there's a study done in California that showed that um, the state was using competency examinations as a way to um, uh, bring kind of chronic people who weren't dangerous, but they were bizarre. Like, and they would, you know, maybe arrest them for disorderly conduct, um, loitering. They bring them to trial. They say they weren't competent. They would have their person do a competency examination and find them not competent. And, and as a, because then they get to be sent to a commitment hearing and then they get to be committed, right? Have orders, like maybe forced drugging. Um, and so, uh, Yes, you know, my representing myself may be indicative of, you know, maybe evidence that I'm not competent, but if somebody wanted to find me not competent, they could have found an expert witness to say I was not. Does that answer your question? It does. I was thinking about what you said that in Vermont you can't represent yourself. And I was wondering if you were gonna um, question that as well. Well, that's not part of this bill. And I, you know, I, I do believe that, <laughs> I kind of do believe that, the, you know, the attorney who has her, her, her him or their self for, for a client, you know, is a fool. Um, but sometimes in my case, I felt like I had a better shot um, at getting out. And I also felt like representing myself was evidence itself that I didn't need to be committed. Um, you needed a competent hearing for the lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I gave a competence as yes. Um, but no, I don't, I, it's not the subject of this bill and I'm not, rep, and I, I, I'm not arguing it at this stage that, 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 that uh, people, I do feel like they have the right, but I don't think it's um, appropriate and I'm not really prepared to argue for that now. I do think that it would be helpful to give them a copy of the report, because when you've been diagnosed with a mental illness, you your agency is always removed from you. You are always just a specimen. You're always just something that information is extracted for. And mad freedom is, it, you know, we're we're trying to give people back their power and their agency, um, not just in the abstract, but it is a path to um, well-being. Um, it is. The, the only way um, you know, to free yourself from the system is to become responsible for yourself. Um, so I, I just think it's, it's just so important that the respondent not be just manipulated and objectified through this process, but be treated like a human being um, and be given the report. It, I don't see any harm in giving the, um, the report um, you know, psychiatrists may come in and say, well, yeah, it's, a, it's harmful because they can't handle the information. But I, I just think that's ridiculous. Um, I think it should be given um, as a matter of right. Um, and if you want an exception, let, it, let someone prove, uh, go to an evidentiary hearing and let them prove um, that there's a reason not to give the defendant a copy of the report. Thank you. Uh, uh, Bob has a question. Yes, thank you. Good morning, Wilda. Thanks for being here. Uh, just a point of clarification here, when we're talking about the, the responder receiving a copy of the examination here, uh, with, with Vermont being a, a discovery state and the state's attorney receiving a copy, obviously they, they should have access to this. And more importantly, 
if in fact their attorney is sent a copy of this, then clearly they must have access to a report through one of these uh, two, two, two individual agencies, correct? You're asking if simply giving the report to the attorney guarantees that the uh, defendant will also receive it? No, it guarantees the defendant has access to the report if in fact his or her attorney receives a copy of it. You know, it's, I, I don't trust that. As a person who's been involved in this system, I know things have been hidden from me um, and I wouldn't trust, I, I, I just, in a real world way, I would not trust that. I, I would like it to be codified in statute because if it isn't in statute, someone could argue that, you know, the, the legislature didn't intend for the, for the person to see it. And also if the respondent is not cooperating with uh, their attorney and doesn't uh, want that attorney and doesn't feel like that attorney is uh, representing their best interest. Um, and, you know, particularly in a competency hearing where sometimes the attorney takes a position that the respondent doesn't like. Like they will say you're not competent and the respondent will insist they are. In that sense, there's not a very good attorney-client relationship. Um, and so I wouldn't depend on um, that as a, a, a sure means of guaranteeing that the respondent has, an access, has access to the report. Yeah, and I agree they should have access to the report, but I was just, once again, not the, the little things here is, they should have access to it. In fact, both of those attorneys receive a copy of it. And that's somebody dropping the ball, so to speak. In fact, they don't receive a copy of it, but to codify it, there's not a problem that either. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and actually, um, excuse me, I'm looking at the language on page one current law, and it it says copies of the reports of the state's attorney to the respondent's attorney if the respondent is represented by counsel. So I think that 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 question of whether or not there's always an attorney is, seems to be um, left open uh, by the language. Good point. Um, uh, Kate. Thanks, sorry, taking a minute to unmute. Um, good morning, Wilda, thanks for being here. If it's okay, I just wanted to respond um, also to Bob's question in my capacity as a, a social worker, I think, um, Oftentimes, and I know we're, we're talking about attorneys, but I imagine this translates into that world as well. Like if you're working with someone within a community mental health setting, you have these um, lots of forms you sign certainly, and you're supposed to have a right to access to your file, but they always have a disclaimer in there that allows the agency to determine if the person is some version of like quote unquote safe enough to receive access to their file. So there's always this ongoing dialogue that if someone is has a mental health condition, that it's that the agency has the power to assess if giving them that information is going to somehow trigger some kind of mental health event in them that would make them unsafe. And so there's always these mechanisms in place that allow for some level of denying folks access to information that should otherwise be legally available to them. So I just wanna, just wanna explain a little bit of how that can happen on the back end. Yes, Representative Donnelly, what you described is exactly why I, uh, what I was alluding to, you, you stated very clearly. So thank you for that. Uh, Coach. Wilda, every time you come, uh, I learn something new. Uh, so thank you. Um, uh, being an avid student, um, you're a great teacher. Um, I spent, well, I've always been an advocate for uh, students and families and um, uh, doing social work for a six-year stint. Uh, with uh, Northeast Family Institute here in Vermont and working in the court system uh, as a therapeutic case manager. Um, I would agree with, uh, uh, you know, what Kate was sharing. Uh, and some of the uh, 
being an advocate in that situation, um, unless we are very, very clear, and, and, and I am in agreement uh, that it's important that it be stated, there's always that intrinsic bias, you know, whatever the bias may be, mm-hmm. that either um, one of the defending attorneys or the prosecuting attorney or even the judge may have. And when you're sitting in a family court and, and, and those of you that have participated in family court, it's a very closed environment. So not everybody gets access. And, and I spent a lot of time at family court and the dynamics were, were just really uh, fascinating to me. But it was also clear that it's important that we codify you know, now that I'm in the legislature and looking at it from this, the policy perspective, it becomes even more clear. So I, I do appreciate, you know, those uh, comments and uh, opportunities to get more clarity for us uh, in, you know, in this. Uh, and and then we get into the uh, the youth the youth side of things where the adults uh, in the room uh, are guiding the process. And, and that whole question of competency uh, comes into play even in that realm as well. So now you've got multiple um, uh, controls over the individual, you know, their age, and then the mitigating factor, you know, of competence, <laughs> you know, it, it, and it just complicates, you know, the, the, the whole thing. And especially if people come in with, uh, you know, with bias, you know, be it against uh, uh, people with a mental health issue, be it, you know, color, be it, you know, any women, you know, I've seen seen that. Uh, oh, you know, they're just too emotional, and you know, and I've heard people actually say that. You know, in a courtroom, and you go, "Wait a minute!" But uh, so, thank you. I, I, sorry to. Um, it just brings a lot, you know, of uh, uh, the importance of being clear here. So, thank you again. Thank you, Coach Christie. So, um, there are no other questions. Not seeing any. Okay. Um, so, and then, so the next area that S3 addresses is still back on the competency, um, is still back in this, this competency examination. Um, and it's uh, now I'm on page two, uh, that first paragraph that's uh, subsection two. Uh, and here, what the, the change in the law um, that S3 is proposing is if a uh, person's, you know, here whose competency is being challenged, um, under the current law, um, the psychologist can be asked to both um, assess the person's competency to stand trial and also at the same time assess whether the person was insane um, at the time of the uh, alleged uh, offense. Under the under S3, um, these two examinations could not be done at the same time if the person was found not competent. So for so, so the last sentence in subsection two on page two says um, the examination of the person's sanity shall only be undertaken if the psychiatrist or psychologist is able to form the opinion that the person is competent to stand trial. Now I heard I think it was uh, Morning Fox testify in the Senate that uh, best practices, whatever those are. Um, it, it is to do these separately at two different times. Um, 
and in some way, and in some ways, um, you know, this that that makes me very nervous because, um, it, you know, a person a person may not become competent for a long time, uh, and memories mm -hmm. fade and witnesses disappear, um, and that defendant is put at a disadvantage um, the longer um, that evaluation is from the time that crime was committed. Um, you know, a case in point, you know, there was a period of time in my life when I could not conform my conduct um, to, to, to what it would have been had I not been psychotic or manic and, and, and probably to the law. You know, I was not, fortunately wasn't uh, arrested for anything that I did or charged with anything that I did, but I clearly, when I was psychotic, felt possessed. I felt like I could not um, form my conduct. However, um, and say at the you know at the same time that that was happening, I was also you know unable to assist my attorney with my defense for whatever reason. Um, and then they waited until I regained competency. And in my case, um, my psychosis and mania had been triggered by medication, and so. Um, after a while, I stopped taking that medication and, you know, I presented as I, I'm presenting today. Um, and so if, if at that time, then a, you know, a psychiatrist comes to examine me to determine whether I was um, insane at the time of the um, offense, um, they, they may be unduly skewed by my current presentation rather than my presentation closer to the time of the offense. Or in my case, you know, other, there, might, there, there were witnesses who could have given valuable information about my behavior during my a period of psychosis and mania that would have um, further evidenced my um, inability to conform my conduct. But memories fade um, and those witnesses may not be available at that later, later date. So I feel like this change, while it might be expedient um, and it may save money, um, does really put that, uh, that defendant at a disadvantage. Now I say that knowing that it, it is the psychiatrists who are impl impl implicitly saying that they're able to do this evaluation whenever. Um, but I, I also um, feel like the law really operates on a fiction that these psychiatrists and examiners really can tell whether someone could conform their conduct to the law or um, knew that their actions were not competent. And so in some ways, you know, I have to, it's almost, <laughs> I have to hold two competing thoughts and I'm, I'm presenting to you two competing thoughts at the same time. And I'm asking you to consider them both. One is a psychiatrist saying that they're able to do it. And, and, and my saying, that they should be required to, to do them at the same time because it's better for the defendant um, because of you know, evidence fading. So that's a little, uh, anyway, so I, I really think the law should remain the same that if somebody knows they're going to be making a, 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 an insanity defense and there's also a claim that they're not competent that those, um, that, that the defendant should have the right to have that examination conducted um, at the time, um, just so that uh, memories don't fade and evidence doesn't become stale or, or spoiled. Um, any, any questions about that before I move on? Not, I'm not seeing any, but, um, but thank, thank you for that. And I, I know this section uh, is a is a piece that the attorney um, general's office um, is interested in, and, I, and they won't be able to testify today. But I'll I will um, make sure to to present your questions. So our concerns. So thank you. So I did have a question, uh, Maxine. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you for jumping in. Yeah, go ahead. So nice to see you, Wilda. Um, so are you suggest? Do you have a language suggestion, or are you just saying completely take out that uh, section two on page two? I can send you language because what I just suggested was that the defendant should have some say in this about when this examination is conducted. Um, just, just for preservation of, of, of evidence. Um, yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense what you what you said. I was just wondering if, in, in particular, where the change would be. Um, 
be, but all right, no, th I appreciate that. Thank you. So the final area where um, S3 kind of changes this um, competency examination hearing is it now allows the state to, S S3 proposes to allow the state or the prosecution to examine, uh, hire its own um, examiner if it disagrees with the neutral um, uh, report, basically. So like I said before, someone's competency is questioned, the court orders a examination, DMH um, hires the person, they do the examination. And that under the, and so then under S3, the proposed bill, if, if the state doesn't like the results of that examination, it's allowed to hire its own person um, to examine uh, the defendant. And, um, you know, this is such a blatant case of, of um, you know, expert shopping um, th that, I, you know, I, I, I'm obviously very much opposed um, to this. Um, I, I, I don't, I think it really makes kind of a, a mockery out of the whole uh, system because, you know, I could see if maybe if you were doing it at the same time and, you know, you wanted your person and they had their person and you did it at the same time and it wasn't dependent on what the result was, but, you know, that would probably be a, a, a better case, but waiting until you don't like the um, report and then hiring your own um, to, to get you know, your own result. It just means that now we just have two competing um, reports. The judge is going to have to decide between them. This is just another instance for a lot of biases to enter into the process. Um, and I don't think it, um, it elevates fairness or justice. Um, I, I just really feel like it just tries to force a, uh, a conclusion. Um, and I think it's a policy question um, about whether you know, this, is, this is what we want to do. There's also, um, you know, there's, also a, um, there's also testimony that it's unconstitutional to allow uh, the, the, the prosecution to examine the defendant. Um, some people have cited this case, People versus Sharo. I don't read People versus Sharo as saying that allowing the prosecution to um, have its own evaluation of the defendant's competency is unconstitutional. What People versus Sharo says is that it's not currently in the statute, and so you don't have a right to do it. Um, and apparently, that's probably why this statute is uh, being changed. Um, but I, I think it's worth reading People versus Sharo, and it's also worth reading the cases that People versus Sharo uh, relies on, a, a Kentucky case, Bishop versus Caudill, uh, because it, it really explains what the policy issues are in allowing a prosecution to conduct its own examination of a defendant at this stage of the process. Because remember, competency, the defendant has no choice. Um, whether uh, they can't waive competency, they're just an object and, and to be examined. Um, and there are you know, real issues of, of uh, getting, you know, the, the defendant you know, may say something that um, discloses his attorney's thought process, which the, the prosecution is not entitled to, and which cannot really be cured by um, not, you know, using it, what, I mean, the bell has been rung. So there's some, there's some real policy issues. I don't think they're constitutional issues, but I think there's some real policy issues that this committee should grapple with. And I think they're really well laid out um, in both the People versus Sharrow decision and the underlying case that they rely on, Bishop versus Caudill. Um, and I don't wanna get too in the weeds, but I would encourage the, um, the committee um, to, to look at those issues and decide for itself um, where it stands on the policy issue. Are there any questions there? 
Thank you. And I think you said you would send us the sites or maybe they are. Yeah, the yeah I'll, I will send it. Uh, yes, I'm going to commit my testimony in writing and I will uh, submit um, the cases and the legal citations. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Really, really appreciate Professor White, Dr. White. <laughs> <laughs> and, okay. Um, so, and, so, and then the... Um, Sorry, can I, can I jump in really quickly? I sure. have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I don't, I don't, I'm at the risk of mischaracterizing what, what folks said the other day in taking testimony. My sense is that there is, there's agreement around this concern that the process of assessing competency or, or insanity, I guess for that matter, is getting drawn out and that there's this ability to sort of like keep reassessing until some, someone receives like the report that they're looking for. Um, it seems like this amendment from folks on this who, who were advocating on behalf of it was like aimed at addressing that. I, I don't fully understand how it would address that, especially given the testimony you're giving, which is it could just prolong it even further potentially. I guess I'm just curious in your experience, like, do you have thoughts on a more effective system in this regard? Like, it sounds like it's not necessarily working well for a variety of folks. And I'm just trying to envision how that kind of assessment process could work differently that would um, not allow it to just be used as a tool in this way that it seems to be currently. I, mean, I think the problem, it really lies with um, psychiatrist and or psychology forensic psychiatrist and psychologist and um, and I say that because I, mean, I I read I recently read a law review article that did a study uh, with forensic psychiatrists and psychology it gave them two vignettes um, gave them three different standards for finding competency or insanity. And it asked them, you know, how how they would rule, and the how, what what the report would show, and 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 the result of the study was that these forensic psychiatrists were all over the place. There was no consistency, um, and so it, and so I think those of us who who who've been subjected to these examinations and their results understand that these forensic psychiatrists are actually being asked to do something that um, is, is, they really don't, they can't do, and they can't do consistency. There's no calibration between them. Um, and so we look at uh, all of these other elements of the system, you know, there's so many other, there's so many decision points in the system and we, we're looking at all of them, but we never look at that one. You know, how can we get more consistency in these examinations um, so that you're not, uh, and so that it's not possible to uh, shop for um, forensic psychiatrists to give you the opinion that you want. Um, how can we hold them accountable? How can we make that profession uh, more consistent? Uh, and, and I think that's, that's where we should be looking. I personally don't understand how a, uh, in a, a forensic, having been, let me, let me back up. Having been manic and psychotic myself, for a protracted period of time and having my own treating psychiatrist refuse to recognize that I was psychotic and manic simply because I was telling him I was psychotic and manic. Um, I don't have competent confidence in psychiatrists to consistently um, evaluate um, whether someone was, com is, was competent or is competent or was insane or not insane at the time of trial. But that's where the problem lies. Um, you know, when, you, when I heard the people who lost family members and who were angry with the system, um, they, never, they never indicted that part of the system. But that is, you know, that is a part of the system that has a lot of power here. Um, and we're not looking at it. Uh, and I think lay people don't understand. Um, it, and I think the problem is exacerbated because lay people don't understand what it means not to be competent. I heard, um, I think Kelly Carroll say during her testimony in the Senate, 
that the person who, you know, kind of lay in wait for her daughter pulled up his pants before running to um, kill her. And she felt like his pulling up his pants was a sign that he was competent rather than incompetent. And I think, so the problem is, you know, many fold. One is the public doesn't understand what's involved um, in, 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 um, in competency. Also, the public doesn't understand that you can be insane and not able to conform your conduct. And also uh, for me in my case, go to work every day, try cases every day. I secured the largest settlement of a, of a lawsuit that I ever received when I was psychotic. Um, so <laughs> you've asked a big question and I've given you an answer that you probably won't hear very often. Um, uh, although the, if you if you actually, I think there are some some lawyers out there who are writing law review articles who are saying something similar to me about the problems with forensic examinations. Um, but I think that's what needs to be reformed, frankly. Thank you, and I'm not I'm not going to do it in this moment. But it makes me think about the forensic working group that is written into this bill and whether. There's a way if, if if we hone in on that, or when we hone in on that language, if we can think about whether that's in, that part of the system is encapsulated here, and if it's not, let's put it in there. I I agree that that's something that should be looked at. Thank you. I don't know how though, but I think we shouldn't overlook that step in the process. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, and I'll I'll make a note of that in, in that section. So then we move on to um, the other part of the bill that, um, so we're back at this commitment hearing and what the law changes, what Bill S3 proposes to change here are some, um, um, you know, one that the Department of Mental Health can appear at the hearing, Matt Freedom does not, um, we're not opposed to that. Um, the other is that um, the defendant can be represented at that commitment hearing by uh, someone from the Mental Health Law Project. Matt Freedom is not opposed to that at all. Um, and then the, the other thing that's changed by uh, S3 are um, what I'm going to call notices to the public. Um, and so um, in, in one instance, um, now I'm on page five, um, subdivision like 2A basically says that when a person has been found not guilty by reason of insanity, so it's this person down here or this person here not competent um, and they've been committed, the, the S3 would um, require some notices to the uh, state's attorney or the attorney general um, and, and the state's attorney and attorney general would be required to give that notice to the public. Um, that's, that's one part of it. And, and then there's a second notice requirement where if a person <clears throat> not guilty by reason of insanity, oh my gosh, such a sensitive slide. Um, not built here by reason of insanity or not competent, um, if the Commissioner of Mental Health becomes aware that the person is not complying with the order of hospitalization or the alternative treatment has not been adequate to meet the person's needs, then um, they're required to give notice to the uh, state's attorney or the attorney general. Um, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the, um, the second instance first, um, and that is, the, this, this requirement under S3 that if the commissioner becomes aware that the person is not complying with the order or the alternative treatment has not been adequate to meet the person's needs, they're, it's, they're required to give notice. So in the Senate, and I think in some of the early testimony, even in the House, most people talked about this provision as possibly um, violating HIPAA. Um, but in my mind, HIPAA is the least of our worries here. Because if you recall, those of you who are attorneys um, and I still remember 
law school, um, you know, the, the US Constitution also has um, guarantees the right to privacy, um, the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. Um, and this second provision, where this, this, the, the bill proposes to require the um, commissioner to notify the, uh, the attorney general or the state's attorney that someone's not complying with, with an order or the treatment is not successful um, is a, in my mind, a very clear violation of the US Constitution. Um, because um, there's nothing in the statute that says what they're supposed to do with the information. And while the US Supreme Court has um, said that these rights to privacy is not you know, it, it, they can be, um, uh, you know, lessened if there's compelling state interest. When you're telling someone that they can have access to someone's private information, but you're not even saying what they're supposed to do with the information, you have not shown a compelling state interest. And I don't, I, I don't see any way how this provision could pass constitutional muster, HIPAA, you know, is irrelevant as far as I'm concerned here. It does not even pass constitutional muster uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and then um, on the- uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, Wilda. I, yeah. I just wanna make sure I, I, um, I understand your, your point. So, so the notice goes to the um, state's attorney or the attorney general and then on the next page, page six, it talks about, um, then the notice is provided um, to any victim who has not opted out of receiving notice. So that's was, the first note, that's, that's only about, um, that's when the person you know, escapes. The, okay. So there's two notice provision. The first okay. notice provision, it, it goes to victims. The second notice provision, the, the state, the S3 doesn't say what happens with the information. It just goes to the attorney general and the state's attorney. Okay, all right. So, and I'm, I'm addressing 2C right now on page six where it says- Okay, if, yes, yeah, yeah. Yep. So that I think is clearly unconstitutional because you haven't shown a compelling state interest because you haven't even said what you're going to do with it. And all the testimony admits that we don't know why we're doing this. Um, I think it gives people a false sense of security. I think it's um, clearly uh, unconstitutional. Um, and it, it, it's, it has no purpose. Um, it just, um, the only thing it does is uh, further, you know, kind of stigmatize, oppress uh, people who have, um, you know, been, uh, who have a, you know, who have been found not competent. Um, or who have found not guilty by reason of insanity. And in the case, remember, in the case of someone who's found not competent, they're under the law presumed innocent. They haven't been convicted of anything. They've had no adjudication uh, of the trial. And so I think there's probably going to be an even stricter um, uh, you know, constitutional look at that because they have been presumed, um, they, they still have the presumption of innocence, which is different from a person so this person not competent has not had a trial. They, they're presumed innocent under our law. Not guilty by reason of insanity, sure, they've had a trial. But in both cases, I think it's unconstitutional because there's no compelling state interest in just passing along information um, where you've said you don't even know what they should do with the information. Um, well, thank you. And, and actually, we, do, we have had other witnesses that have said that um, recognize that this needs work and that, that they um, are committed to to uh, reworking it, so so I appreciate that. So, in the interest of time, I'm. I mean, I I I have. I, I'm going to stop there because I know that there are other people, and you have a short day today. I do have, uh, you know, um, comment about this forensic working group. I can just put it in writing if you wish, or just no, say. I, please, um, please, please take your time. I um, I I did ask Evan to send out a um, sort of a disclaimer or caveat that we didn't know whether or not. We would when we would be back if we'd make it through everybody's testimony. So um, it's important to to hear your hear your testimony um, in 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 full. Um, if if that works, if that still works for you, but I, I certainly don't want you to feel rushed. Okay, um, sh thank you. So um, uh, so so then I will move to the um, 
this forensic care working group. Um, and I guess I just want to make two points right now. Um, the first is, you know, there are a lot of people on this on this forensic working group, and you've said uh, a person with lived experience of, of of mental illness, and you know, um, that I, I feel like that person's that person's token voice will get drowned out, and it's not enough. Um, to just have a lived experience of a mental illness to participate um, fully in this type of hearing. Um, we, you know, we, we wanna be more than just informants. We also want to be epistemic agents. And I think it would be helpful if, first of all, there's more than one person who with a lived experience of mental illness, but also that they actually have some experience um, with this issue. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot to hold your own um, in a lineup that includes the people here. Um, and uh, also people's experiences of having mental illnesses are not all the same. You know, I've, I've been heard to say that if you met one person with a mental illness, you've met one person with a mental illness. Um, and so I would encourage you to put more people, more than just one person and also not have just the lived experience of mental illness as the only, um, you know, kind of price of admission, but that they also have some experience with these issues and something to um, something to contribute uh, to this. The other problem I think with this forensic care working group is um, it, it, it directs people to, you know, it directs this review board to look at Connecticut Psychiatric Security Review Board, and it always. Uh, makes me nervous when the legislature is already kind of telling the work group what they want them to look at. I attended a uh, grand rounds uh, in the psychiatry department at UVM where um, there was a presentation on this uh, Connecticut Psychi Psychiatric Security Re Review Board. Someone who's actually on your witness list um, uh, did the presentation um, and, and she explained about this Connecticut Psychiatric Security Board and was asking questions about whether this is something that um, Vermont should adopt. And during the q and I asked her, I was like, why are you, why are you pointing us to Connecticut? You know, Connecticut is um, one of the wealthiest states in the country by income. It's also one of the densest states by, you know, population. Um, it does not have um, you know, this, this uh, kind of order of hospitalization. They don't do forced drugging like we do here uh, in Vermont. They don't do that in Connecticut. And so I said, why are you pointing out that system as something that um, Vermont should adopt? And um, she said, well, she wasn't saying that Vermont should adopt it. And um, she was saying, you know, that was a system that she knew. Um, and she, so she was holding that up. And she also said that maybe there are things that Vermont could, could, could learn from it. Um, but I, I think that re like requiring this work group to, you know, look at that um, is, is too much like, you know, kind of putting your finger on the scale, at, at a, especially at a state that's very different from Vermont and has very different resources. And so um, I would ask that that provision not be so um, specific um, in what they should look at, but actually include what you're trying to, I mean, include something broader than improving public safety. Um, uh, and kind of give more directions to what kind of what Vermont's values are and what Vermont is trying to accomplish rather than just looking at specific systems. Um, so I'm gonna stop there for, for today. Thank you, thank you so much. This is incredibly helpful. And the other day I was saying, I wish we had a flow chart. <laughs> <laughs> and here, and here it is. Um, so I so so appreciate your your testimony. Uh, I see Kate has her hand up. Kate, thanks. Um, so I had maybe two questions. But the first one, you were talking about in in the section that's referring to reporting out to victims. Um, you were talking about a compelling state interest. And I was wondering, so in other arenas of mental health, I think it was maybe in Vermont, like the Tarasoff um, ruling maybe, but essentially it gave permission if you, 
if you had essentially like an identified target who was, it was clear that this person was at risk of imminent harm, it created the opportunity for a mental health provider to essentially like a duty to warn essentially. Um, and that keeps coming up in my mind in this case. And like, how, do, how does the statutory language align here? Or like, but maybe that's another thing, but I'm wondering if, is that the kind of thing you're referring to when you talk about a compelling state interest or does that mean something different? Um, I, I think a duty to warn it would be considered, not a duty to warn, but a, uh, you know, public safety may, may be a compelling state interest. But um, it has to be like your infringement on someone's right to privacy has to be um, you know, closely tied with your goal of public safety, right? I mean, that's what a compelling state interest is. It's like, yes, we're infringing on your right, but we're doing so to achieve this um, compelling state interest, which in, in, in the case of like the Tarasov warning is, is public safety. Um, but in this, in that provision that I pointed out, you haven't said what your compelling state interest is because you say, yeah, we're going to infringe this person's right to privacy, but we don't know why because we're not saying what we're going to do with the information. Um, does that answer your question? I yeah, I, I, I it it I does, think, and I think. And, <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, I think it does answer it. And again, maybe just a thing to flag, I think in, in the realm of mental health, it's dictated around assessing the person's state in the moment. It seems like in this bill in front of us, it's like dictated just by, by an act, like someone did or didn't follow through with a certain condition. It's not assessing whether that person is actually poses a risk. To anyone exactly, exactly. Um, because it's just saying you didn't comply with your treatment plan well you could be fine i'm not complying with my treatment plan and i'm fine i'm not a risk um or you know your treatment isn't working but it's not spelled out like what does it mean not to be working um you're doing this regardless of whether the person is a risk or not um, the person could be fine going to work every day doing whatever they want to um following the law but you're still saying if if in someone's opinion, um, these things are true, you should report it, but you're not saying why, you're not saying what they should do with it. Um, and, we, and also I think there's probably some, I won't get into the weeds, because I was say there's probably some due process issues here too, but I won't go into that. Okay, thank you. And then uh, I'll ask this question, but I'm, I'm thinking it's probably for uh, maybe morning Fox later on. I get. I I am sort of like confused by that section on page two, number two, the the section that addresses someone doing two assessments at once. And the thing that kept coming to mind for me, this notion of clarifying that um, you know, examining a person's sanity shall only be undertaken if a psychiatrist or psychologist is able to form the opinion that person is competent to stand trial. It made me wonder about. Are they, are they trying to make a statement about the assessor's ability to assess sanity because the person in the moment is in a state where they're not deemed competent? Like, is this, is this provision about assessment? I don't know if you, if you know much about what the driving force behind this or, and if that's the case, like how you might respond to that, if that question is making sense to you. Well, remember, on the current law, they're doing those assessments and have done those assessments at the same time. So were they not able to, you know, I don't, you know, so they have been doing them and other states do them at the same time, even when someone's found not competent. And remember competence, the question is narrow, right? They're only asking in this, can you help, can you assist your lawyer, you know? Um, can you, do you understand the, the procedure? It's not competence in the way that you may know it as a social worker where you're saying, you know, competence for other people, can they manage their own affairs? That's not the question here. Um, it's just those, those narrow questions about, do they understand this, this procedure um, in this courtroom? So my answer would be one, they're, they're currently doing it. Other states do it all the time. Um, they've done it in Vermont all the time. Um, 
And uh, I'm more concerned about kind of the, the spoliation of evidence, the loss of evidence, the fading memories, and, and, and knowing in my case that, you know, if you wait till someone's completely like back to um, their baseline, um, they may be more uh, basing their determination on, on the baseline rather than um, how you appeared at, at the time. Thank you, that's helpful. Thank you. Not seeing any other hands and again, I will encourage Representative Donahue and Representative Morrissey to, nope, no, no questions, okay, great. Well, Wilda, as always, thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your your testimony. And thank you. I appreciate your patience. I went on much longer than I thought I was going to. So it was it was great. No, that <laughs> it was really really helpful as as always. And so do uh, do take care. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and as I said, we'll be continuing this this bill. Um, and you'll you'll get Zoom links for when we do it next next week. All right, and I will submit something in writing to that further. Okay. okay, great, and we'll have it posted. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, um, Kristen Chandler, I believe this is here. Welcome. Hello, here. good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, for having me here. Um, Will is always a tough act to follow, I gotta say, so <laughs> my timing is not great. Um, Fine, thank you so much. Oh, you bet. Um, just a little bit of background. I, I was an assistant attorney general in the Department of Mental Health and I, uh, for eight years, and I came to that job from being a prosecutor for 10 years in uh, King County, Washington. And when I was at DMH, I handled all of the forensic cases because of my criminal prosecutor background. So that meant that I worked with all the state's attorneys and the defense attorneys when somebody was found incompetent or insane, or if there was some suggestion of there was a mental health component to their criminal case. So I would appear in court um, uh, and just help them try to resolve their cases. And so I am fully in support of the provision in this bill that allows for this, the attorney general to, to be present and for uh, Jack McCullough's shop, the Mental Health Law Project, to represent the defendants. Um, just because the state's attorneys and the public defenders just really, you know, they have so many other types of cases going on. It really will be much more helpful to have somebody with expertise there to represent and make sure the defendant uh, is represented, um, you know, robustly, I'll say. Um, what I do now is I subcontract with the Vermont Care Partners and I run a training program um, for police and other first responders on mental health response. And so I'm coming at this from a different perspective, really from the designated agency perspective and with that experience that I had. And I was on the summer study committee for the, when we looked at ONHs in general. Um, and Part of that process, when an ONH... Oh, sorry, I'm going to thank you. ONH stands for... <laughs> sorry, Order of Non-Hospitalization. Great, thank yeah, you. Sorry. Um, and I, I also just wanted to say that I heard on Wednesday, I heard uh, Representative Burdett's questions about competency and sanity, and Eric does such a great job of trying to explain that. I just, I had happened to have a PowerPoint all done because I presented on that at a conference, um, and I teach that at Norwich, so I sent that in, uh, in case you're more of a visual learner than a, than a listening learner. Um, so that's available for you as well. Um, so when a, an, an order of non-hospitalization comes out of criminal court, um, there's gotta be some input from designated agencies. And that's really where I'm coming from today is, uh, you know, the, the, if somebody is incompetent, the prosecutors, um, if, and if they're incompetent as a result of a major mental illness, because I think it's really um, important to keep in mind that people can also be incompetent for other reasons. And I think Representative Donahue pointed that out uh, earlier in the week, because there are some people who are incompetent because of a, a intellectual disability or a low IQ or a TBI, and they don't fall under the statute. Um, so this is really narrow to people who, be, as a result of their major mental illness, they uh, 
could qualify to be on an order of non-hospitalization. And that is a commitment to the care and custody of the Commissioner of Mental Health. It's a big deal. It means that their right to possess a firearm is taken away. It, it falls under the Brady Bill uh, provisions when you're, you've been, it's a commitment. Even though it may be in the community, it's, it's, you're in the care and custody of the commissioner. Um, so in that, the order of non-hospitalization, initially it's good for 90 days and the conditions in there might include lots of things. And, and Jack McCullough talked about what those are. He talked about those yesterday um, or the other day. So what, what's difficult for the designated mental health agencies is when somebody is placed on an order of non-hospitalization who they are not familiar with. Actually, excuse me, I'm going to, I, I see Representative Donahue has her, her hand up, so. Uh, thank you. Yes, um, Chris and I, it, just to go back a second, because I, I think some of this is new territory for some of the, the committee members. And if you could just clarify, when you said that TBI and uh, developmental disability are not under this statute, I'm assuming you meant this bill and this process as opposed to not being under the statute as grounds for being found um, to have a mental disease or defect and therefore not guilty by reason of insanity. What I mean is they, they are those, uh, and it's a, it's a pretty wide category, the intellectual disability prohibits somebody from being in the care and custody of the commissioner if that's their yeah. only presentation. Yes, thank you. So okay. that part of the of the statute doesn't apply to them, but they, but they are under the broader statute for being found not competent or Absolutely. not guilty yes. by reason of insanity. Yes, thank and you. So just wanted to distinguish those two. No, thank you for that. And that and that just represents an entire different problem where there's no comparable system or um, uh, you know custody for them. Um, and I used to keep track of those cases as well. It was very, very frustrating for prosecutors uh, who had to dismiss cases and there was no alternative at all. That's for a different day though. Today, it's really about the conditions in the order of non-hospitalization. Um, it's really helpful for the designated agency to have input into that. And if they don't know the person, uh, it's really hard for them to know what treatment will actually be effective, uh, what, could, what those conditions should look like. So I think that that's one of the big reasons that having Department of Mental Health present at the hearings, hopefully that communication flow will be really great and they'll have some input from the designated mental health agency. The, um, the real issue here is uh, the same issue a lot of people have brought up, which is on page six, section three, the notice issue about when the Department of Mental Health becomes aware that the person is not complying with the conditions um, or that the treatment is inadequate. The way that the Department of Mental Health becomes aware is through the designated mental health agency because they're providing the care, they're working as a team with the person who used to be a defendant and is now a client and, try, and making sure that they're in compliance with those conditions. Um, lots of times people are not in compliance but it doesn't mean they're not in a, healthy in a healthy space or doing well. Um, and so this is the issue is like, at, at what point does the designated agency have to make DMH aware that they're not in compliance? And I know Representative Rachelson brought up the other day about liability issues at, for DMH. Well, it's a liability for the designated mental health agency that I'm concerned about um, if they don't re re report this. And I'll just give you an example. Um, and I, and I had many of these, but I think this is a great one where I had a psychiatrist call me up and say, hey, my guy's on an ONH. He's doing really well. He's working well with the team. One of the provisions, one of the conditions is you're not supposed to uh, use any illicit drugs. And, he, and I know that he's smoking pot, but I don't think it's really affecting his treatment. Do I need to report this? Do I need to, and, and to, by reporting it means you're, you're asking the Department of Mental Health to revoke his order of non-hospitalization. You can either revoke it or you can amend it. Um, but generally when the designated agency is asking, telling DMH that somebody has not complied with their conditions, they're asking to start that revocation process. And the only remedy from that is really to put somebody in the hospital. Um, 
So that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. And I, and I outlined that in my written material as well. And I think a lot of people have brought that up that, um, you know, if somebody is, has, has a beer, is that, you know, technically, yes, that's not abiding by conditions, but you've got to look at the big picture. And I, and I get from my prosecutor hat, I get that what, um, what prosecutors want to know about are really the major violations and the things that might put the, the community at risk. And so I really hope that that entire language could be stricken until that study committee has a chance to really look at what are we talking about here? And I think you could narrow it down to um, a, a, a way less of a broad category of what needs to be, um, it, you know, what, what DMH needs to report to the state's attorneys. Um, so that's... Um, Thank you. And so when you say that entire section, um, are you referring to section C? Um, yeah. On page six? yeah, that under two uh, and sub C, yes. Okay. Um, or at least, I mean, I, I did notice that this is supposed to, the, the committee right now is supposed to be uh, complete with their work by November 1st. And this is supposed to go into effect on July 1st as currently written. Um, I also agree that the study committee is going to need way more time to, to look at all of the things that currently are being asked of it. Absolutely. Um, Thank and you. I'll just say that there are lots and lots of interventions that are tried. So, so the, when the mental health agency is working with that client, somebody who's on an order of non-hospitalization and they know that they're, they're um, not complying, like, like maybe they're not uh, taking their med, maybe they've missed some medications or they, they're not living in the housing that they want them to. They have a whole team of people around them that, and they meet regularly and they try lots of other interventions before they get to this last resort of having to revoke their order of non-hospitalization. And, and I will say that for some clients, it's a piece of paper and it really doesn't mean a lot to them. For other clients, it, is, it has a judge's signature on it and it is, it is what keeps them in treatment. And there's a, um, I did I did see, I heard that, uh, I think Representative Burdett, it was, might, might've had some questions about the numbers that we're talking about here, how many people are found incompetent or insane, how many people might fall under this um, category of being, being um, eligible for an order of non-hospitalization. So I put, I had some numbers in that presentation as well that were, they were from 2018 but they're in that PowerPoint if you want to take a look at those. Um, so that's, if I'm happy to take questions, but that's really what I wanted to point out. Great, thank, thank you so much, very, very helpful. And, and your, um, your PowerPoint, your slideshow is, um, is posted. So yeah. okay. that'd be very helpful to, to folks. Uh, Barbara. Thank you. Um, so thank you for your testimony. I'm wondering if you can help me um, I have worked at a community mental health agency. It's been a while and I didn't work really in the department that would be um, overseeing um, people who are found um, incompetent. So I'm more familiar with how probation works mm -hmm. and I was hoping you could kind of compare and contrast what probation and terms of probation um, provide versus what the designated agency is providing. And I know that it differs from designated agency because some have more robust resources than others. Right, right. Well, um, and this is the thing, um, when, I, when, I, when I train police officers, I tell them that this, in, in order of non-hospitalization, is it's not a ticket back to the hospital. You can't just yank somebody back into the hospital there. You have to go through a legal process, um, which is the revocation hearing. Um, for probation, you know, you can have violations of probation that you still have to involve a state's attorney and there still has to be a, a court hearing. So in that way, they're similar. But there can be conditions of probation or furlough um, that are not illegal. They're not necessarily committing another crime. Absolutely. Yes. But they could be in violation of their probation conditions, which would be a separate offense. Um, so the, the, what, what the 
designated agency can provide, the mental health agency can provide is lots of different things. And as you said, it will depend on the particular region of the state where they are, but uh, housing, uh, um, it could be a vocational uh, oversight. There could be medication management, if that's what the person needs. Um, if they, um, they will always have a case manager. Somebody on an order of non-hospitalization will always have a case manager. That they meet with once a week or like what's the- Totally depends. Depends okay. on what the needs are. There, you know, and I, and I will also let you know, there's, there's people out, out in the community who were found incompetent, um, who um, were charged with murder and were initially right. found incompetent. They spent some time in the hospital. They, they're right. able to comply with treatment they don't need to be in a hospital. They are out on the street right. and they're out being served in our community. So the range from people, so you go from a murder all the way to, to misdemeanors could, could fall under uh, somebody where an order of non-hospitalization is issued out of criminal court. So there's a wide variety there. So it's really gonna depend on the person. And, there, and the, that's why the conditions can be flexible depending on what the needs are. So and, Okay, I'm sorry. Can I, so the condition of somebody smoking marijuana, if it's not a big deal, why? Like, why is it even on the list? Like, why yeah. not pare that list down? Right. To begin well, with, um, as you can imagine, that that's something that that it it may be something that the prosecutor thinks should be in there. You know, depending on what the crime is, but generally, the the people we really want to have the most input into those conditions is the mental health agency who will be in charge of treating that person. So the state attorney has to sign off on the conditions, um, because that seems they don't usually. Well, in my experience, what used to happen is uh, everybody would stipulate or agree that in that the state would dismiss their criminal charge as long as the defendant at that time was going on an order of non-hospitalization. And yeah, I think the state's attorney and the defense attorney would sign the ONH. I, I, as I recall, I believe that's how, how the process went. Um, and have people raised concern about being a treatment provider and being, uh, and the relationship being, um, Compromised. Uh, compromised to yeah. some degree because yeah. they're also the uh, reporter. Yes, exactly. Well, and this is the thing about orders of non-hospitalization that you can't force somebody into treatment. They have to actually want to, to be treated. Sure. And that's what would be really, what, what I, in my experience, was really hard for those individuals who, um, you know, committed a crime, came into our uh you know, jurisdiction only because they committed some kind of a crime were unknown to the mental health agency. Um, you just don't know like what would be appropriate for them. Um, and it made it really hard because it was, uh, while the person is named in the order of non-hospitalization and it's up to them to abide by the conditions, if the conditions don't actually fit what they should be doing for treatment, um, it's hard to abide by them. So um, it was always a lot easier when the criminal defendant was known to the mental health agency and they could actually hit some background and they had some ideas about what, what were the, actually the needs here. Um, and, and not everybody needs uh, that kind of an order in order to stay in treatment. Right. But it was sort of the trade-off with getting their charges dismissed. So it, I, I, I've got to say, I mean, this is sort of not your expertise, but I've got to say, if we had the same um, factors going for people who are still in DOC of they're not, they won't benefit from being incarcerated and they could be out and receiving treatment for murder. I mean, it's just, it's just interesting that on one side, we are willing to do that with public safety and we're not on the other side. Um, but anyway, yeah. I, I yeah. realize that's not your, your area. Um, and do you have any comments about the psychiatrist? I mean, it is true. Like you can get psychiatrists on both sides of the, so I don't know if when DMH is 
getting expertise if, you know, the the medical director at even four different mental health agencies are giving different opinions. Yeah. Well, you know, everybody's different. And um, uh, I think that it's, I think you are going to hear from somebody with expertise in forensic psychiatry or psychology. Um, and I think that they're probably a better person to explain that. I did have, I mean, I, I heard Wilda uh, talk about her concern about splitting up those um, evaluations. And I initially, when I saw that language, I thought, well, why, why would you have, why would you do them separately? Because you're going to actually, I think, save money by doing them together. Um, and, and her, uh, I know her concern about um, the loss of evidence and, and time going by, if you didn't get to the sanity piece until later, you know, um, what I, and, and I, and I worked with all of those because uh, Department of Mental Health has the contract with the forensic psychiatrists. Um, I read a lot of reports and um, over right. the years and I, and what they're really looking at is what the actions were of the defendant before, during, and after the crime in order to determine sanity. And those things don't, that evidence doesn't change. That, that's, that's still gonna be there. So, um, and, I, and I think from what I heard from what Wilda said is that her concern was more what the um, defendant themselves would be able to recall in that interview Maybe. with the uh, psychiatrist. Right. But there's, there is still gonna be um, evidence that is preserved no matter how much farther down the line that exam, you know, when that exam occurs. But I also think, uh, I'm sure the Department of Mental Health has some ideas about why it would benefit them or be beneficial to have those um, examination separate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Representative Donahue and then Kate. Yeah, thank you. I have, I have several questions for, for um, Kristen, but I, I wanted to briefly just respond to Representative Rachelson when you were drawing the parallel between um, being released on conditions and treatment and why we would uh, handle it uh, differently between corrections and uh, mental health. And just, just a reminder that people in corrections have been convicted of the crime. And the yes, people we're talking point. about now yeah. have not right. been. <laughs> yes, thank you. That's, so, that's it. Yeah. And yeah. Thanks, Sam. So, yeah. Um, but um, uh, Kristen, and if this goes too far back, it, it's fine. I, I really wanted to ask you some questions that are drawing from your experience and time at, uh, at DMH and your role there, um, because you were, you were referencing um, revoking an ONH, um, which is, as you pointed out, a court process. Um, but am I right that when and if that happened, it was usually because DMH brought a petition to revoke to the court because it felt the person, uh, if it was to return to the hospital, it was because DMH felt the person needed to be back in the hospital. Is that? Well, th it, would, it would begin, it all, those revocations always begin with some notice from the mental health agency to DMH, who then would file in court. And that back then, the pro, it was a very, it, it took a long time to get to court depending on what county you were in, but it often could take three or four months to have a hearing. And then at that, and by that point, a lot of times those revocations were dismissed because the person had decompensated to the point where they were on a new emergency exam or a new mental health warrant. Um, since the ONH Summer Study Committee, uh, there's been an effort to um, expedite those hearings, those revocation hearings, so they don't take so long. Because the idea is like something's going on right now and we need to address it. Um, but it's, so it's, uh, it's the really the current treatment providers. So it would be the community mental health provide, the, that team that would um, testify and work with the Department of Mental Health Legal Division in preparing for that revocation hearing in making that determination of whether hospitalization was necessary. Because the only the other possible remedy is to amend the conditions. 
Um, so like, for example, if the condition was uh, take all medications as prescribed and they thought the person wasn't taking their medications, they could add in uh, take medications in front of, um, you know, your medication provider, for example, to make sure that somebody was actually adhering to the condition. So it's either, but, but so it's, uh, you know, to answer your question, it's not, I wouldn't technically say it's, while DMH is the person who is in court, it, that information has come from the community mental health provider. It's being driven by the um, the the treatment needs, and then DMH is the one who petitions the court. And DMH might or might not say, and we think this person needs to be have it revoked and returned to the hospital based on an assessment of needing to be in the hospital. That's correct. And okay. and sometimes it would just that process of filing it, and would 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 be kind of a, almost like a treatment tool. And it would, the client would say like, oh, wow, like this, you guys are serious and then would get into compliance. And so then it's very easy to just dismiss that revocation. So is DMH the only one who's permitted to apply to the court for a revocation? Could a state's attorney uh, petition it, it, the court? It's, it's no, the Department of Mental Health has that uh, jurisdiction. So, so no one else, if, if, if the court, could the court on its own initiative? Um, I don't believe so. I haven't looked at that part of the statute for a while, but I don't believe so, Representative Donahue, that the court could do that on their own. Um, thank you. Can, can the court, if DMH is recommending a change in the, um, a change in conditions, but not necessarily recommending hospitalization. Do you know offhand? And, and again, if you haven't had a chance to look at the statute, it's maybe it's not a fair question. But uh, but I'm wondering uh, if the court can order hospitalization um, without DMH having, say, had a psychiatrist evaluation that they need hospitalization. Is it within the yeah, court's no, no, authority I, I, to decide? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've had hearings where a psychiatrist didn't testify. You know, it might be an APR, uh, advanced practice registered nurse, for example, if, if they were part of the treatment team or other members of the treatment team who were testifying about the non-compliance and the potential danger to the community or to the, to the patient. Um, that could happen. And, and the other one other thing that could happen is we could we would uh, communicate with the mental health law project who represented the client and sometimes we would agree on how to resolve it without hospitalization. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not asking the question clearly. So if, if DMH is, has brought a petition um, because of, of a compliance issue and DMH is, is recommending a change in the conditions um, and, the, and, the, and there's not a psychiatrist uh, has not said that they um, actually meet the level for needing hospitalization does the court have the authority to order hospitalization without, uh, for instance, an admitting psychiatrist saying that they are in a need for that level of care? I, I, get, I get your question now, sorry about that. No, the, no, the court couldn't do that without evidence to demonstrate that the person needed hospitalization. Are you, Anna, are you all set or I can't? You, or? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. I... Okay. okay, great. Um, okay, so I see Kate and then Coach and then um, hoping that we can hear from the Medical Society before we adjourn. Go ahead, uh, Kate. Thanks. Um, so I just want to, you apologize to make you repeat yourself because I think you sort of talked through this already, but I just want to get it clear in my mind. So if there's an order of non-hospitalization, I guess the first question is, are, were you saying that it's the it's the court or, or the attorneys essentially that that sort of dictate what that initial order will be, like what, what the person will have to follow in the community? Is that what 
you were yeah. saying. Yes, usually um, DMH would draft it, um, hopefully with input from the mental health agency, the designated agency for what those conditions should be. We'd send it around to the both the state's attorney and the defense attorney so they could take a look at it. And then we'd present it in court. I, I would present it in court. And remember, this was this was not, I mean, I it was sort of the state's attorneys were like, yeah, Kristen, you know, please do this because I don't know what I'm doing. It wasn't like that it was actually allowed, but it was, you know, we just did it because it was easier to do it that way. It was a lot easier. So the Department of Mental Health and the designated agency do have an opportunity in the very beginning to help draft what the order is, but they might be doing that without really, they're doing that without necessarily knowing who the client well, right, or the okay, yeah. defendant. So what would happen is Department of Mental Health, we'd, we'd get the evaluation back. And if the forensic psychiatrist found the person to be not competent, then I would alert both parties like, hey, okay, this defendant is not competent. So your own, here are your options. And if they were not competent because of a major mental illness, I'd say, you know, either they could go on an order of non-hospitalization or the designated agency, you know, doesn't know them. And is there another way to resolve this? Um, you know, the, or, you know, do you really, um, you know, based on what the forensic psychiatrist said, I don't know what treatment would be appropriate. Or I'd say, the reason that they're incompetent is for this whole other reason. And now you don't really have any options other than to dismiss the case. So I would do that. They would be alerted to that. And then, and then um, I could help provide the input through. So I was sort of the liaison, if you will, through the, for, for the um, designated agency to provide input into what the condition should be. What, what also has happened though, um, is that sometimes uh, a case would just come up in, co in criminal court that, that nobody would know about. Um, and the, and the, the designated agency would not have an opportunity for any input. And suddenly a defendant would show up at their door and say, hey, I was court ordered to come here for treatment. And here's, the, here's a copy of the order. And the agency would be like, well, you know, we can't do this or we can do this. You know, it was just way more difficult. That's why having representation from DMH and from Mental Health Law Project will be, I think, really, really helpful. So <clears throat> thanks for that clarification. It's helpful. And so I guess that, well, so the, the way the bill is written is that the commissioner of mental health would have to alert the attorneys if a person is not complying with the order or the alternative treatment isn't adequate to meet their needs. But I, I feel like what I'm hearing you say is that's what is that's sort of already true. Is that is that already sort of like behaviorally what's happening, or does this section of the like is this is this part of the bill putting into statute what's already happening, or is this requiring something in addition? Well, this is requiring the the Department of Mental Health to notify the state's attorney. That that is not when somebody is not in compliance. So, like in the past, right now. If Department of Mental Health files a revocation of an ONH, an order of non-hospitalization, they don't they don't notify the state's attorney. If it came out of criminal court, state's attorney wouldn't know, and that's what their that's what their concern is that they ought to know that somebody is not in compliance. And I'll, I'll also tell you that there were times where you know um, somebody like a, a police officer or even a state's attorney at one point let me know like, hey, did you know that so-and-so is living next door to his victim when the ONH said, you got to stay, you know, 500 feet away from your victim. Um, and so they would, they might alert me to that. And then I would just in turn get in touch with the designated mental health agency and say, hey, you know, why is this guy living within 500 feet of his victim? You know, so it's the notice requirement. It's always it's always up to the designated mental health agency to notify the Department of Mental Health when somebody is not in compliance with the order of non-hospitalization. That's their obligation. 
but it's, and like I said before, it, if it's not really affecting their treatment, you know, they may not think that it's necessary to notify them. And so you're saying that the path to amend the order is essentially in, in the beginning, the same path as revoking the order. Like you have to make this report to DMH that they're not in compliance or that you want to amend it. And so is the, is the way that this current bill in front of us written essentially saying that if DMH was working with someone who is on an order of non-hospitalization and they found that the order didn't align with what this person needed and they were then reporting that to DMH in an effort to amend it, that that would also be sent to the state's attorney. Like any, is it sort of written well, such that like, that's, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, that, that's how I read it. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that, that's how no. I read it. It says, you know, like, uh, the only way, I mean, the way that DMH becomes aware, other than those weird circumstances I just said, the way that they become aware that the person is not complying is through the mental health agency. So, um, you know, that's, that's, that's going to happen. I mean, if, if that doesn't change what's happened, what the, this, this, um, bill does not change what the current practice is, which is if a mental health agency, if somebody is, if they have a client on an order of non-hospitalization who's not in compliance, they have an obligation to let the Department of Mental Health know that, so that it, it, that they, there needs to be a revocation filed. Um, that doesn't change. This just adds on then in turn, now if this passes, that the Department of Mental Health would have to notify the state's attorney. So it's that becomes okay, aware you. section that's just really you know, that, that's, that's what the big concern is, is given the, um, the spirit of this the whole point of this is to make sure that the state's attorney, you know, assuming the ONH came out of a, a criminal act and that there might be a victim, that they'd want to notify that person, you know, do, do, does the mental health agency have to report every single little non-compliance that that's the concern thank you okay great uh coach sorry about that had to un unmute uh kristen thank you very much for uh, uh joining us today um so basically um the commissioner um, has um, like jurisdiction similar to uh, the commissioner of uh, uh, corrections uh, as far as um, uh, the onus of responsibility in these cases Correct. Uh, for the agency. Uh, and then similar to um, the uh, uh, commissioner of uh, children and families uh, for uh, children under his care Correct. or her care. Um, so, so hopefully what we're attempting to do, I'm just getting that flow chart piece together, uh, is to, um, clarify some of those unclear gaps, you know, in the process. It seems like like some of the things that you provided um, uh, in your uh, experience have been helpful, uh, but they hadn't been codified. Exactly correct. Uh, well, well, okay. well it's the piece about having the attorney general and the mental health law project present at the hospitalization hearing that will happen in criminal court, that has not been codified. Correct. Okay. And I did that regularly. I went around the whole state when I was there. I left there eight years ago and they, you know, I mean, I had a real passion for it and I had the background, so it made sense. But, um, and they still they still keep track of some of the cases, but not all, I mean, not all of the criminal cases where somebody is uh, incompetent or insane um, at the time of the crime. So it's not, a, it's not as um, consistent, I would say, but this, this should make it, very consistent, I hope. Great, great. Thanks, Kristen. You bet. 
Madam Chair, you're muted. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, and I think your hand is up from before. I just want to make, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, okay. Not, not seeing anybody else. Um, okay, so we, I did want to hear from the, um, from the Medical Society, but I also realized that it is Good Friday. Um, so I just wanna be um, sensitive to, to that. So I am hoping, so I'm sorry that we're not getting to, to everybody, um, but we knew that might be the case. So I'm, I'm, I think it's, a uh, is it Eric Thursday morning that we, um, I'm sorry, um, Evan, Thursday morning that I think we have the schedules, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, I'll work on it. Okay. That's what um, I'm hoping that we'll get back to this on Thursday morning and have have the uh, the whole morning. So um, so with that, um, 